Now, let's welcome school board member Megan Alderton, who will introduce our hosts. And good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Megan Alderton, and I am a school board member here in the city of Alexandria. Um, <clears throat> I'm very excited to be here um, and very excited for this session. And so I'll just briefly give, you, uh, give everyone an overview of this particular session. This is the third um, in a series that we've been um, doing about the history of our city. And this session is, will be particularly um, exciting and interesting because we are going to get the real story um, behind Remember the Titans. And I know that this is a um, famous story, and so it'll be nice to, to really dig into what really happened during that time in our city. Um, just a reminder for everyone, um, the session is on Facebook, um, and it will also be posted to uh, the ACPS website um, So in a few days. So you will be able to catch this later. Um, and also a reminder to please post your questions in the Q&A um, and we will have time for questions and answers at the, toward the end of the session. Um, really quickly, I know Dr. Hutchings is here. Um, so our superintendent, Dr. Hutchings, is here and I'm guessing he'll probably, um, I don't know if he wants to say hello now or he'll say um, just something brief at the end of the session. And um, I'm also going to introduce our panelists uh, for today. So our panelists today, um, we are welcoming back Dr. Douglas Reed, um, who is the author of Building the Federal Schoolhouse. Um, he is the executive director, um, I'm sorry, he is the director of a MA program in educational equity at Georgetown University. So um, welcome, um, Dr. Reed, we're really excited to have you back today. And he will be in conversations again with the wonderful Ms. Kenitra Wood, who is our Director of Equity and Alternative Programs. So thank you guys for um, speaking with us again today. And I am going to hand this session over to you guys. Very excited to, to hear from you both today. Thank you, Ms. Alderton, uh, for, the, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming uh, again for the part three of our community read-in, uh, the real story behind Remember the Titans. Um, uh, this one actually is making me a little nervous because uh, I've got Denzel Washington to compete with here for uh, uh, star power, and that's clearly I'm going to lose that battle. Uh, but this has been a, a really wonderful experience, um, and I really want to especially thank uh, my colleague, uh, Kenitra Wood, uh, for um, our sessions and planning these. It's been really uh, a wonderful opportunity to work with her, and I, I thank her deeply. Um, so there, there are many ways to engage uh, the, the story of the 1971 uh, state football championship team here in Alexandria. Um, on one level, there's the, the straight up history. There's the, uh, the actual history of the players, the season, the games. You can actually go online and watch clips of old uh, football footage uh, uh, and read uh, biographies of, of the players and, and where they are now. Uh, there's cottage industry uh, of all of that. Um, then there's also uh, the legendary stories that get told uh, uh, based on the film uh, uh, with Denzel Washington as coach and, and an, an array of, of stars who really got their careers launched in this film. Um, and these stories take on um, uh, a larger than life uh, attributes. Um, and then finally, there's the, the closing words of, of the film uh, and the overt message of, of racial tolerance and inclusion. Uh, the film kind of hits you over the head with it, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful and inspirational message nonetheless. Uh, it's, a, it's a message of a community overcoming racial injustice uh, and personal animus to really rally behind a football team uh, and to become united in a greater cause. And, and the final closing words of, of the film kind of capture the whole thing. Uh, people say that it can't work black and white. Well, here we make it work every day. Uh, we have our disagreements, of course, but before we reach for hate, always, always, we remember the Titans. Um, but I just want to focus today primarily on uh, a question that kind of uh, predates uh, uh, that, that football team, right? The question of why did we get one high school in Alexandria? 
why was it necessary in a community that had three high schools um, to, to merge all of them into one integrated high school? It was too many students even back then, uh, but what was the rationale? What was the context that led to uh, this high school? It was the size of the high school that really drove the athletic success. Um, and and uh, that decision to create this high school is, is an important one. In order to do that, we really have to dig into some background context, however. Uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about the community contexts of race and desegregation in 1971. Uh, I want to talk about some of the student experiences in, in high school and, 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 and protests within, within the black community over uh, conditions that they were experiencing. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, John Albom's uh, ideas for what was referred to as the 6222 plan, uh, which created uh, the one high school. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the impact on athletics uh, and some some almost uh, some details about the season of 1971. That story of the winning season has been told, but there's some additional things that we might want to flesh out. And then finally, I'm going to close with uh, some general, broader questions uh, about Alexandria's identity uh, after uh, that season, and and uh, also the, the circumstances within TC Williams after that season, and how much actually changed. Uh, uh, in terms of integration and opportunity uh, for students. Uh, Dr. Then, Reed, I'm sorry, this is Julie, and I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but we've gotten a couple of comments in the chat that um, that your volume is low. I don't know if it's your computer, but if you can raise it a little bit, some people are just having a tough time hearing you. Sorry about that. So no, thank you for thank you for chiming in. Um, uh, so and then after uh, my speak, uh, Kenitra Wood will. Um, uh, finish the conclusion. Okay. So, the context of, of race uh, in, in, in the early 1970s, late 1960s in Alexandria uh, is, is one that uh, is full of conflict, really. Um, in the fall of uh, 1969, in an early October evening, um, there were about 10 uh, black teenagers who were playing football in the Arlandria neighborhood uh, of Alexandria. Uh, a police officer named Claiborne Callahan came along uh, and told the, told the teenagers to, to break up the game, to, to move along. Uh, according to one of the kids, he used the word colored with them. Uh, they asked him why he did that, and they asked, them, asked him to use the word black. Uh, or, or even Negro instead of, of the term colored. Uh, the kids, after their confrontation with Callahan, kind of drifted away. Um, some of them didn't, and Callahan began chasing one of them, a, a guy named Keith Strickland. He grabs him, pulls him down an alleyway, um, and uh, the other boys come back. They drift back because uh, they're worried about their friend uh, Keith Strickland. Uh, at that point, Callahan feels outnumbered, and he pulls a gun on all of those uh, uh, boys. Um, uh, the kids then start to turn uh, and run away. Strickland breaks free from Callahan and starts walking slowly away. Callahan grabs him again and starts pistol whipping him. Um, by this time, there was a crowd that had ga gathered. It eventually gathered into about uh, 30 people. Um, uh, Strickland himself passes out from the blows that he'd received from Callahan. Uh, Callahan uh, Strickland's mother comes and tries to pull her son out of the, uh, Callahan's hands, uh, and Callahan pushes her away onto the ground. Uh, eventually, uh, Callahan is able to pull Strickland into the squad car uh, and, and, and arrests him. In his police report, Callahan indicated that he was being uh, attacked by uh, boys with two by fours and being uh, assaulted with, with rockets, um, I'm sorry, with um, uh, bottles, uh, all of which the, the boys uh, 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 denied. So the press accounts of this, of this conflict sparked enormous uh, protests within the black community in Alexandria. Um, for them, this was the tip of the iceberg. They had been uh, uh, encountering numerous police and, and uh, uh, black youth conflicts uh, because of uh, police over-policing within the community. Um, and they, about 150 uh, black residents 
um, marched into the city council chambers and demanded both police reforms uh, and the resignation of, of Chief Russell Hawes, uh, who had served on the police force in Alexandria since 1930. Um, his quote here from this newspaper uh, sort of gives you his indication of, of the attitude that he felt towards uh, African Americans. There was another conflict that emerged more tragic uh, about five months, six months later in, in May of 1970. Uh, Robin uh, Gibson, who was a, a student at George Washington High School, went into a 7-Eleven store that's over on the corner of Commonwealth Avenue in West Glebe. Uh, there was uh, a conflict that broke out between the clerk uh, and Gibson. The clerk accused Gibson of, of shoplifting some razor blades. When Gibson turned his pockets out to indicate that he had nothing in his pockets, uh, Hannah, the, the clerk, shot and killed Gibson, shot him in the chest and in the neck. Uh, as Gibson lay on the floor and was dying, Hannah put a knife next to the body uh, and told police that Gibson had tried to attack him. Uh, that murder um, sparked some of the, the most persistent and intense protests in the history of Alexandria. Uh, for six nights, uh, the youth and, and many adults in, in Alexandria, in the black community, um, protested, uh, ranging from uh, Molotov cocktail, cocktails to um, uh, setting some cars on fire, uh, to rock throwing, just uh, an outpouring of, of emotion over the death of, of Gibson. Gibson himself, like I said, was a student at George Washington High School. Um, the trial that proceeded after that uh, murder um, was galvanizing for the community. Uh, shortly after Gibson's funeral, uh, there was a city council election, uh, uh, and the city council race, uh, in, for the first time, uh, there was, there was a, the, a victory by a black candidate because of an outpouring of, of black voters in the wake of this uh, uh, tragedy. Um, the trial itself was something of a farce. There was a Confederate flag up in the courtroom. Um, the, there was a hung jury. Uh, that refused to convict Hannah for the murder. Uh, and uh, Hannah was eventually sentenced to six months of uh, a jail time, which uh, he, generally, he did not serve because of, of, uh, of good behavior. Um, at a memorial service two days after that sentencing, there were 450 students uh, from GW High School uh, that stood up and spoke uh, at, at, well, 450 students attended the, the memorial. Robert Callahan, who was the sophomore class president at GW, stated in his eulogy for his friend uh, Gibson, said, quote, the so-called Christian white people who pushed the blacks aside in this city are going straight to hell. After that service, 250 of those students marched down to City Hall and met with the common, Commonwealth attorney demanding that justice be done. But he insisted there was really nothing could do. These two incidents, both Keith Strickland's beating um, by the hands of police and, and Robin Gibson's murder um, and the, the uh, inadequate justice that was served, really galvanized the black students within Alexandria. Uh, it sparked a politicization of their, of their um, complaints. Um, and it, it led to their mobilization uh, and increasing radicalization. Uh, and that radicalization wound up challenging the leaders of, of Alexandria's school system. There were other racial incidents within schools that were particularly galling. Uh, at GW in, in the fall of 1970, uh, uh, a black woman, a black student was, was named Homecoming Queen uh, and the white senior class president uh, use the N-word to describe her. Uh, efforts to remove him from office were defeated in a vote. They, they tried to uh, impeach him, uh, but the white students outvoted the uh, uh, black students. Eventually, the principal removed him from office, uh, and a, a popular black football player was named instead uh, as, as senior class president. Um, other protests were um, 
quite common within within that fall of 1970 into the spring of 1971. Um, students were um, frustrated with the leadership at the schools uh, and not being responsive to their complaints. They wanted more black teachers. They wanted more courses on black history. Uh, they wanted, uh, quite frankly, they also put in their demands, they wanted better lunches, um, some, something that's a perennial complaint among students. For the white leadership within the community and for many white parents, they saw this really as an issue of discipline uh, as in terms of uh, as integration was proceeding. And they felt like the schools were, were um, getting out of hand in their view. Uh, and that led to uh, uh, intense pressure on, on uh, John Albom, the superintendent. Uh, there were numerous complaints by white uh, parents that uh, there, was, there was decreasing discipline and there was frustration all the way around. So in response, John Albom winds up coming up with a plan uh, to take all three of these high schools. He's got, he's got a very unsettled student population that is deeply frustrated with the political leadership within the community. They're becoming uh, into their own sort of sense of, of agency and, and, and efficacy, uh, and they're making demands, uh, and they're, they're not being quiet. Um, and he's seeing a whole series of other changes that are, are coming at the school system, and he, and he He's trying to come up with a response that can hold the schools together. And there was a, a confidential memo he wrote uh, pr prior to the public announcement of the 6222 plan. Uh, and this is the intro paragraph to that memo. Um, and I'm just going to read you this, this paragraph because it, it really captures all the things that he's trying to balance as he's, he's figuring out what to do in uh, Alexandria. The schools are being held accountable for social and political changes not of the schools making. Budget stresses, racial conflicts, resegregation, militancy on the part of white and black students, parent concerns with the drug scene, court order involving extension of adult civil rights to pupils in schools, teacher strikes, irrelevant curriculum offerings, all interfere with the basic purpose of public education which purpose is to provide an education in citizenship and an education in skills and in learning toward the good end of good citizenship and the ability to make a living and contribute to American society. So he sees these um, challenges, he sees these stresses as really fundamentally attacking the idea of how education can contribute to citizenship, can contribute to that sense of the common good uh, and, and how, how the city should respond to all of these multiple pressures. So his ultimate plan is to develop uh, uh, what's called the 6222 uh, model. That, that plan basically, his goal in that plan is to do this. What we will have to do is build a new school in a town that has become urban rather than suburban. So. As Alexandria was going through the changes of being a sub, from being a suburban to an increasingly um, what he termed urban, uh, which in many ways I think is kind of a code for um, uh, dominated by students of color. Um, so he felt like he needed to build a, uh, a new structure that could pull everybody together. And that structure basically consisted of moving all grades one through six into elementary school. Um, and then uh, having grades seven and eight in, in a middle school, uh, and then using the two high schools, Hammond and George Washington, as junior highs for grades nine and ten, uh, and then putting all the juniors and seniors in T.C. Williams. T.C. Williams was the newest school. Uh, it was the, the school that um, uh, is at the center of town, so it was most convenient for, for uh, grades 11 and 12 for all students. So. Um, one, one dimension of this, of this change, was you're taking effectively three athletic programs and merging them into one. Um, and there was uh, overt and, and um, explicit understanding that this was going to be a, a very 
uh, dynamic athletic program. Um, the, the director of athletics for the school system at a, a school board meeting where they were debating whether or not to adopt this plan said, if this plan is approved, juniors and seniors throughout the city will be blended into one great high school whose entire sports program will be second to none in Northern Virginia and comparable to the best in this state. So um, it was partly a selling point to a community that was a bit skeptical. Um, he talked about the pedagogical advantages of it. Um, he talked a little bit about uh, the need for greater integration, but it was really sold as something that would uh, uh, boost the, the fortunes of a school system that were, were lagging a little bit. And, and sports were deeply important to uh, uh, um, Alexandria, as they are to many communities. Um, and there had been conflicts in other uh, episodes. Uh, there were intense rivalries between the three high schools, uh, and he wanted to sort of diminish those intra-city rivalries um, and turn that energy into sort of working for all of Alexandria. Um, the undefeated season proceeded um, uh, in, in, you know, the film shows how, how it unfolds in, in dramatic fashion, uh, but there's some interesting things to, to sort of note uh, as, 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 as it unfolded. Uh, in the film, there was, uh, there is uh, an account of them going to Gettysburg College uh, to go to training camp. That, that actually was paid for by a federal grant, uh, a federal grant that was made available to reduce interracial conflict at schools that are undergoing uh, desegregation. Um, and so they, uh, they received significant monies from the federal government to, to pay for that. Uh, also, at the beginning of the school year um, at T.C. Williams, uh, members of the football team were uh, assigned to patrol the school's hallways, and they wore their football team jerseys as they did so. And they, the, the idea was that they were in a position of, of sort of influence and authority to uh, reduce racial conflict with, within the school. Uh, and it generally worked. Uh, T.C. Williams in 1971 uh, was uh, uh, relatively conflict-free. Um, uh, Hammond and GW had some other uh, difficulties, uh, but eventually they settled down over the course of, of the year. Um, there were fights. Uh, the film shows it, and, and, and the, per the players in their own uh, accounts of the season talk about the fights. Um, those fights broke out among the players but more because there was such intense competition for playing time uh, and for starting positions uh, than for racial reasons. One, one player commented that um, there would be black students, black players fighting against black players, white guys fighting against white players, white guys fighting black guys. It was really about the positions and playing time uh, in, in a pretty intense and competitive environment. Uh, and I think Coach Boone, as a pretty intense and competitive individual himself, uh, didn't necessarily see that that competition as a bad thing. Um, the film took took a number of liberties, uh, as as we're all aware, um, but it also captured some truths. And so I'm just going to highlight a couple of those. Uh, the film depicted a, a brick being thrown through the window at Coach Boone's house. In reality, those vandals actually threw an entire toilet uh, through the window uh, in in an effort to intimidate him. Uh, uh, he found that particularly disturbing, as, as I can imagine he would. Um, the players themselves, uh, as they were going off to the training camp, uh, they self-segregated initially by race, uh, and Boone forced them to reboard uh, before they headed off to camp. Uh, defensive players on one bus, offensive players on another, really trying to ensure that that integrated uh, uh, goal that he was was striving for. Um, he did get nervous before games, and in fact he threw up, he says, before each game. Um, and of course the, the tragic story of, of linebacker uh, Gary Bertier, who was paralyzed in a car accident, that occurred after the conclusion of the season, not prior to the, ch to the championship game. So, what happens after the story of of Remember the Titans. What happens to the school um, when there is a, a celebration of interracial victory uh, in an undefeated season? 
and and how does that play out into the the circumstances that that uh, uh, students at the high school experience? Uh, there was a profile of of the football program at TC Williams in 2001, 30 years after the championship, and one year after the film came out. Um, it was a hard hitting profile, and it, it stated a number of things. Um, it talked about the continuing intra school segregation that was that was occurring. Uh, former Superintendent Paul Massam, who, who served from late 80s to early 90s, stated that Alexandria has a huge international community, but the community is socially split and the school is socially split. Um, one of the students uh, who had just recently graduated from TC Williams, Jay uh, Blunt, uh, his former student body president, said in this article, there are no racial class clashes at TC. There is no anger and nobody cares what your race or national origin is. But people stick with their own social class. I saw lots of black kids every day, but I hung out with my white friends, took my AP classes and road crew. Um, and, and the former city manager, Phil Sunder Sunderland, stated it uh, as, as follows. TC tends to differentiate by class and race and social network. We have to do a better job of removing that. So part of what happens after the integration of, of well, it had already been integrated, but after the creation of TC as a single high school um, was a, a powerful message of integration that didn't necessarily translate into an experience of integration for all students. Um, we've talked about things like tracking and other ways in which students uh, uh, were separated, um, but there was also a, a sort of a social uh, division that, that we see as well. At the same time, uh, and I'm gonna close with this and, and turn it over to Kanitra here. Um, this is a, a clip, uh, or a, it's a screenshot of uh, that Pete Ballas actually retweeted from the Alexandria police. Um, uh, Officer Lemley, who is a, a graduate of, of uh, T.C. Williams, uh, led uh, a Black Lives Matter rally um, in the Titan chant in, an after, uh, in a march at City Hall. Um, and in many ways, that sort of exemplifies the ways in which the, the social and cultural experience of attending a single high school within a very diverse community provides powerful um, bonds that can uh, uh, ensure trust within the community. Um, and, and so police officer Lemley, uh, as, as a Titan, uh, wants to express his, his, uh, his deep Alexandria roots uh, in, in support of Black Lives Matter. Um, and so uh, I think there's, there's a, a, an ongoing and powerful message that can be encapsulated by, by a single high school. Um, remember the Titans captures part of it, uh, but it doesn't tell, tell the full story. So I wanna, I wanna turn it over to Ms. Woods uh, and have her continue uh, relating uh, the connections to today's TC Williams. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Um, good evening, everyone. Before I move into um, my slides, Dr. Reed, there was a question that came into the chat that asked, um, what were the student demographics like in ACPS in 1970? In, in 1970, uh, it was the, the entire system was majority white still at that time. Uh, African Americans were the second largest uh, demographic group, roughly about 25 to 30 percent. At that time, there were not, there was not a big um, uh, Latinx population. So it was really a, 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 a sort of a binary system between black students and white students. Um, and and African-American students comprised roughly a quarter. That grew significantly over the course of the 1970s. Okay, thank you. Um, there was another question that came in that I'll respond to and I'll just read. Has it already been decided to change the name of TC and Maury? And can you outline the process that when the timeline that ACPS is using to consider the name change of TC Williams and Maury. And so um, to that, we are in phase one currently 
of the process. And part of phase one is to make sure that we are engaging in the conversation. So the read-ins that we're doing now, this is the third part of a three-part series. Um, student forums are being held, community engagement sessions, including one specifically for Mori, um, are being held. There are also lessons being done for students at both TC and Mori um, to educate them. And we will also be doing a survey to survey our students and community um, on their thoughts around changing the name. Once that is completed, our superintendent will make a recommendation to the board in mid-November. And at the end of November, our school board will to decide whether we are going to move forward with changing the name and the process of that or not. And so that will be phase two of the process. Can you move to the slide, please? Thank you. And so I also want to acknowledge, um, Dr. Reed mentioned the murder of Robin Gibson that sparked um, an even more intense racial strife in the 1970s prior to the Remember the Titans team winning that championship. And then we're 50 years later in 2020 where the murder of Ahmaud Arbery coupled with Breonna Taylor and George Floyd pushed our society into a racial pandemic. And so we wanna make sure that we are realizing that we are in a place right now where people's eyes are open to racial equity and social justice as we move forward. Remember the Titans, imagine the Titans, fulfill the promise. These words are in gold letters in the foyer of our high school auditorium, and they were placed there 10 years ago when I think about what these words mean and how they relate to our students now, I believe we are encouraging our students and community to honor our past, imagine our future, and are charging our titans to achieve greatness as they define, greatness as an individual, as well as greatness as a school community. When we remember, we reflect and value and have learned from the shared struggle to become a champion that rearranged the social construct in Alexandria. And as Dr. Reed mentioned, the students and the, um, the football players at that time, once they came together and, and created this bond, this bond that sports brings together with, um, our, with individuals, there's an important part um, of sports that helps to bring people together in a very special way and helps them to find their commonalities, even in the midst of the racial differences that were happening during that time. The students were patrolling the hallways and seen as um, almost larger than life figures and, and celebrities as they walked through. And what that bond brought for them also kind of bled into what was happening in the everyday world. In, at T.C. Williams High School at that time. It's a testament, that period, of to how human beings, given the opportunity and the space, can find common ground and a bond through those commonalities that can help propel and move things forward to the goal of racial justice. Okay, next slide, please. Imagine the Titans, meaning envisioning valuing our diversity as a norm beyond sport. Creating spaces like that, like football did for that team that help our students come together and find their commonalities and bonds as a community. One thing that we do in ACPS is we use restorative practices and community circles to do just that. It helps us to build relationships with our students and students build relationships with each other. It helps to establish trust, both with staff and students and students alike. And it helps to foster community in a positive environment. And, and, um, and most importantly, provides students with a voice, a voice that gives them the opportunity to express how they feel, to express what learning should happen for them, to express some of the things that might be keeping them from learning. And those things help people find that common ground and that commonality that helps us move past our differences and value and respect each other's differences through knowing that we have common goals and common understanding of where we are and who we are within this world. 
Next slide, please. Fulfill the promise. Fulfilling the promise, the responsibility of every Titan to rise and defend what it means to be a Titan and value the diversity that, brings our, that, that our community brings. Our ACPS vision says that we are empowering all students to thrive in a diverse and ever-changing world because we know every day we are diversifying who we are, identities are changing, people are allowed to be who they want to be, and that should be respected, nourished, and encouraged in order for all of our students and everyone to reach their highest potential. We consistently should ask ourselves, what does it mean to be a Titan today? Are we embracing our diversity? Are we valuing our diversity? ACPS believes through our core values in being welcoming, empowering, equity focused, innovative, results driven. And with all of that, is valuing who our students are as individuals, valuing who we are as a community, and understanding that our differences make us unique. Our differences bring that uniqueness to who we are and should be respected. And I keep saying it, and I'm gonna say it over and over again, valued. Not just understood, not just heard, but valued. That word is very important when we think about what it means when every student comes into our space. Every adult who's working with our student comes into our space. As a community, we have to work together in order to achieve all of this. Next slide, please. Ms. Wood, and before you continue, I just wanna um, give you all a reminder that um, we really should be entering into Q&A in a couple of minutes. So um, if we can, um, it's just a reminder and we can wrap up and make sure we get those questions and answers. Yes, ma'am. This is the last slide. Right. <laughs> so you are right on cue. <laughs> and then just, you know, to bring it full circle, I'll say that we must continue again to ask ourselves who we are as Titans, who we are as individuals, and who we are as a collective community. And we are aspiring to achieve educational equity. And I won't read this because it's there for you to see for yourself, but I do want to say that as a school division, we are committed to eliminating racial inequities, achieving equity for all. Our vision and core values speak to the hearts and souls of our students and our community to explicitly say, we see you, we value you, and we are working to remove the barriers that systemic and institutional racism has elicited in our schools and with our students. Thank you, and we'll move into our Q&A. Well, thank you so much, um, Ms. Wood, and thank you, Dr. Reed. Um, so we do have um, some questions for the panelists. Um, and just a reminder to please put your questions into the Q&A. Um, that is how they will be filtered uh, through to me. Um, and before we answer um, a, a couple of questions that came up, um, just wanted to definitely reiterate that no decision has been made on the name change. Um, I think a lot of questions are coming through about that. So again, reiterating, no, no decisions have been made yet uh, about the name change. All right, so with that, um, I have a question for Ms. Wood. How is ACPS working to change discipline, discipline practices in ACPS? Okay. Um, so one thing that, we, well, first it starts with reviewing our data and understanding where we are with discipline, and we do that on um, a consistent basis throughout the year and yearly to determine one year from the other where our is and how well we are doing with that. I mentioned restorative practices earlier and that is a big part of alternatives to suspension because we want, um, again, our students to feel valued and be heard and have a space in a safe space where they can be heard. Um, we are working with our administrators. They are being trained and there will be work with teachers on what happens when we write referrals and what kind of referrals we're writing in order to um, look at our discipline data and make sure that we are not being, our biases are not showing and coming through as we are looking and disciplining students for things that they may have done or mistakes that they may have made. Um, 
their students, their kids, and every, all, every single one of them is on a path to success. But sometimes on that path, mistakes happen. And so those are some of the things that we're doing to ensure that their voice is heard and we're able to meet their needs. Social, emotional, and academic learning is another way that we are um, working to give students that voice and to help them understand how to express themselves um, and share their feelings and be able to name what's going on with them so that we don't get to the point where some of those mistakes are being made. So there are a lot of things that are in play in order to support the discipline data um, and to reduce that disproportionality within the division. Thank you, Ms. Wood. Um, the next question is for Dr. Reed. Um, Dr. Reed, having read your remarkable book and hearing your three thorough and informative sessions, I wonder if you agree with those of us who feel strongly that T.C. Williams, the man, should not be honored by our city in any way, shape, or form. Um, wow, that's a big question. <laughs> I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a member of the voting public in, in Alexandria. I, I, I don't pay taxes in Alexandria, and I, 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 I don't vote in school board elections in Alexandria. Um, so as a citizen, I don't have a direct say on, on all of that. Um, if you're going to ask me my professional opinion, um, I think it's clear that T.C. Williams embodied a whole set of values that uh, both the school system and the high school um, teachers, faculty, staff, student administrators, um, that they no longer share those values. Um, and so um, I'll leave it up to Alexandria to figure out what to do about that. I'll just sort of make the observation that um, what he stood for is not what uh, the school system stands for now. Thank you. Um, this question is actually for both panelists, um, and this is a broad question. What areas of inequity within ACPS do you consider ripe for immediate change and why? I guess I'll take that one first. That's, um, that's give <laughs> Dr. Reed a chance to think about it. Um, what's, um, what came to mind first when, um, when I heard this question is that we first have to start with our policy. And we are currently um, giving school board and our superintendents direction in the process of securing a equity audit of our school board policy so that we have alignment with our new strategic plan 2025. Um, if our policies are not aligned or there are inequities that are um, adversely impacted, if there are inequities that are, um, if our policy adversely impacts <laughs> um, students um, and causes inequity, then we are already at a deficit. And so looking at our school board policy, ensuring that we are not having adverse um, inequities that are happening and, and impacting students in a negative way um, is the first thing that I think we need to do in order to ensure that we continue on the path. And so policy includes how we discipline. It includes um, our education and instructional purposes. It includes how we feed students. It includes um, every area of our division. And so in order to get to the practice being equitable, we first have to have policies that do not um, elicit inequities within our division. Um, I would just follow up on that and, and, and specifically um, based on sort of my reading of, of research within, within education, one of the things that's really a powerful um, unequalizing force is, is tracking of students and, and their exposure to curriculum uh, and, and, and some of this happens pretty early on in elementary school, uh, particularly around questions about math um, and, and sort of sorting students uh, at key moments uh, within, within their um, sort of learning trajectories. Um, there's, there's evidence that that really, really harms students that are put on the lower track um, and that being tracked on the higher track doesn't necessarily benefit other students that much. So um, the, the costs are really, um, not equally uh, uh, borne out by the students. So I would, I would focus uh, on that, but I'm sure the school system's working on it. Um, I think also uh, bigger, big questions also that uh, about how, where students come in um, and, and sort of the resources they have in sort of that zero to three context um, is, is, is really important as well. Excellent, thank you very much. 
Um, our next question is actually for Dr. Hutchings. Um, Dr. Hutchings, will the recommendations regarding the school name changes submitted to the superintendent be released to the public to ensure the process is transparent? So yeah, so once the board um, has actually voted to change the name um, of the high school, we will go into a process of renaming um, the high school. And that is the opportunity for us to take any uh, references that have been sent now or names that have been sent now that will be compiled and there will be a list of uh, different recommendations and there's a full process that we have. It's a part of our policy um, to determine what the new name um, of the high school. But the first step is for the board to vote, uh, which will be at the end of November. I believe it's November the 23rd um, to vote on changing the name of the high school. And then we will go into the renaming of the high school process. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Hutchings. Um, this question is for Ms. Wood. Um, how diverse are sports teams at TC today? Um, do the costs of uniforms, equipment, transportation challenge the inclusion of all those who are interested in participating? Is diversity and inclusion also challenged in the participation of other extracurricular activities as well as academic achievement? So there's a lot there. There um, is a lot there. <laughs> um, so the diversity within the sports programs today honestly depends on the sport. Um, our football team is, is pretty diverse. I think it's predominantly African-American and Latino. Um, there are white students that play as well. Um, our basketball team, predominantly African-American, when we look at it. Um, our men's soccer team won the state championship um, a couple of years ago, and it was very diverse soccer team. Um, students from all walks of the school, including the International Academy, participate um, in many of our sports. Um, but you look at our ladies soccer team, unfortunately, and, and it's not very diverse. Um, and so that's something that we, we have to acknowledge and think about. And um, as far as um, the things that it takes, like uniforms and things of that nature, transportation, equipment, not a barrier. Um, one thing I really respected when I came to ACPS and I um, valued is that we do a lot to support our students and to remove those barriers so that they can do the things that they would like to do. And I've been in two other divisions in the DMV and I didn't always see that happening. And so that's something I'm very proud of, of being in this division. Um, as far as challenges and other extracurricular activities, it really just depends on what students' interests are. Um, as we spoke a couple of, well, last week and the week before, there are times where, you know, students self-segregate. Um, you may see it in the cafeteria, you may see it in clubs and activities, um, and it really is, who and, and what likes they have and where they want to be. But you look at our drama department and you come to a musical in the spring or the fall play and it's a very diverse cast and you have females playing male characters and vice versa. And you also have um, a diverse racial group of students on that stage playing all different characters. So really it just depends on what you're looking at, what the opportunity or activity is and how students are finding themselves um, in their interests. All right, thank you for that. Um, another question for you, Ms. Wood. Um, what can we do as parent allies going forward? And then a follow-up to that is, what can alumni do to help the process of student development? Well, question. So um, as parents and allies, um, well, first of all, just to talk about allyship is um, definitely um, a leadership role in, in supporting and co-conspirating and standing beside and supporting and leading from behind um, when you talk about the marginalized groups that you're supporting. Um, and really being a leader in, in the front in your own sphere of influence. So in your community where you have parents and that you talk to on a regular or you see people walking their dogs or you're at the dog park and you're having conversations about what's going on, those are the places and the spaces to be able to challenge um, beliefs that are that bring about inequities. Um, those are the places where you can have your influence be known and support and possibly change a heart and mind. Um, learning as much as you can, growing, reading up on things 
that are going on in the school system, supporting what we're doing, supporting our strategic plan, um, and being a local force. And that helps to bring that allyship forward and support the work that we're doing. And as far as the follow-up question, what can alumni do? Um, the same thing. You know, we always need support with our students. We need mentors. Um, we need the people who have organizations or um, companies where, you know, provide opportunities for students, internships, job opportunities. Um, like I said, mentorship is very big. Um, we're always open to our community supporting our students and our schools. And the more hands, the merrier. And the more people who can be involved and be a positive force within our students' lives um, is welcome. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, which is also for you, Ms. Wood, getting all the questions today, um, is centered around teacher demographics. And we know that this is something that um, has really come up as considered a very important issue to address. What are the teacher demographics at TC Williams and how does this affect minority students? Uh, I do not know the exact number at this time, so I'm not gonna quote a percentage number, um, but I will say that um, it is predominantly white um, and then the teaching force in general is predominantly white female. Um, we, we do have, um, diversity within our staff we have diversity within our leadership um, and you know within our schools however the teaching force is predominantly white and predominantly white females um, it can cause problems uh, a years ago there was when and i don't know if dr reed mentioned this or not but it was in his book where um there was a really big issue when they desegregated the schools where the white teachers didn't have an understanding of culture of black students and it caused this major strike which also led to some of the discipline disparities that we see that have kind of rolled through the years today and there's a lot of research right now um, out about white teachers and students of color and that disconnect and so um, but what I will say is that TC Williams in particular has a dynamic equity group that is working on um, building their capacity, building their cultural competence, building their knowledge so that they are not falling into that same um, rut again. And we don't be, hopefully become um, that statistic that goes into someone's writing about that dynamic and that difference that's causing problems. And so that goes back to the same thing, changing what our discipline data looks like and that and those disparities changing how students feel going into honors advanced placement and um and div, uh, dual enrollment courses um having those conversations using our community circles to build relationships and trust um all of those things come into play so that no matter where you stand or no matter who you are um, and, and what racial background you have or what your background is that you bring to the table, that that's valued, the teachers is valued, the students is valued, and there's a common ground where they can come together in a place of trust so that students can thrive and learn. All right, and we're coming up actually on our final question, um, which is the million dollar question, I think, because this seems to, um, be encompass a lot of what has been talked about um, among um, the community and students. Um, so what could ACPS do to ensure that not only our white students are in AP classes, but rather we have more black and Hispanic students. Our black and Hispanic students do not feel like they belong in these classes because they're not culturally relevant. What is ACPS doing now to change the curriculum to integrate more literature that better reflects our student body. Um, and I'd actually like to maybe even add on and ask, um, is it, you know, and, and in regards to this question of students not feeling like they belong to these classes, cultural relevancy and material, but is there anything else that doesn't, that makes them feel like they don't belong? Yeah. So, um, and this goes back to the previous question and, and some of my response there. Um, belonging means that you feel valued and, and who you are and, and what you bring to the table is valued. That's where the belonging comes in. And so 
I don't believe that it is intended that you know students are made to feel that way in most situations. However, there are actions that cause that. Um, I'm a former advanced placement teacher myself, and one thing that I know is that there is no one set curriculum on what has to happen. Um, you do that on your own, you work through the college board to do it, so it's really teacher discretion on what materials are being taught, how it's being taught, and you know, versus rigor. Um, and what that really means to someone is rigor, how much you're able to do or the quality of what you're able to do and the knowledge and the depth that you are able to go. And it doesn't take, you know, extensive <laughs> um, assignments to be able to do some of those things. Our AP classes um, could be diverse based on what we value in our students and what they bring to the table. And so if students are ready for a class or not or or comments about whether you know this student is appropriate for this class or do you really want to take that you had a c in your class like some of those things discourage students right away and so the question really is how hard are you willing to work and what can we do to get you there where are you right now and what can we do to get you to where we need you to be and what does that look like and when we start shifting our thoughts and shifting our conversations and our beliefs and and really it really means checking our biases at the door um and 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 really thinking about how what we say and do impacts the students that we serve and so um with all of those things being said you know it's a process it is a process and being um, in a place where you can be culturally relevant for our students and culturally competent um, and again valuing what they bring to the table and using that using what they bring to the table to help enhance their learning is the first step thank you very much um, mm -hmm. and thank you um, both miss wood uh, both dr reed for um, joining us this evening and sharing your insight um, and we really appreciate you, really appreciate you both. Um, just a reminder to everyone who's watching, um, our we have several engagement sessions, so please, um, you see the slide here, um, follow the Identity Project, um, visit the uh, website link that is here and you will find out everything that is coming um, after this, um, because there's definitely more to come. Um, and you will have feedback opportunities along the way um, and um, many will actually start after these redone sessions. So um, thank you again. Uh, I hope everyone has enjoyed this as much as I have. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you all. And thank you, Dr. Reed. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Thank you all. It's been a wonderful experience. I really appreciate it. Have a lovely evening, everyone.